afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm just going to ease us in gently as the room populates. Uh, I think you guys know the drill at this stage. But whilst I do that, I'll uh, reflect a little bit, because today is a big day for the EU, of course, with the unveiling of the proposed College of Commissioners by President von der Leyen. Will Irish nominee Michael McGrath at Justice be sitting with the Dutch nominee Fopke Hoekstra at Climate once the European Parliament has its say? Time will tell. I'd say they're both sitting pretty, pretty well, though. But of course, and why the discussion today, I think, is of use to you, our audience, the composition of the Commission and those who take the EU's top jobs is a direct consequence of the political makeup and the mood within the EU's member states. And one country which has endured a turbulent political year, again, is the Netherlands. Following elections in November 23, the far-right PVV of Geert Wilders continued its now decades-long rise to come first in a crowded field, with some 15 parties being returned to the 150-seat Tweedekammer, or lower house of the Dutch parliament. Recent years has also seen the rise of another challenger party in the form of the Bay Bay Bay, the Farmers' Party, which increased their seats in the lower house from one to seven, but which hold an important uh, clutch of seats in the upper house and thus have a major impact on Dutch policymaking, as our speaker may reflect on momentarily. And following months of negotiations, a four-party coalition emerged last July. Taken together and at first or indeed second glance, there are loads of parallels and similar themes across Dutch and Irish politics, with increasingly fragmented parliaments, relatively re responsive and proportionate electoral systems, high turnover between elections and with agriculture and migration being increasingly salient in politics, albeit with migration featuring in Ireland in its current form relatively more recently than is the case in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a really interesting country, politically speaking, and much of what I know or that I think I know about it comes from long conversations I've enjoyed with our speaker over years. And it's an enormous pleasure and indeed a great privilege to welcome Professor Leonie de Jonge, who is our speaker today. Leonie is currently Assistant Professor in Political Science at the University of Groningen and will join the faculty at the University of Tübingen in 2025 as the inaugural Professor of Far-Right Extremism Research, which is an enormous achievement at the stage at which Leonie finds herself in her career. Leonie's expertise pertains to populism, the radical right, far-right politics, and European politics more generally. I'm also delighted to say that Leonie and I studied together at the same department and the same college, and we even shared a supervisor for our graduate studies, which binds us together for life. So it's especially nice to welcome you today, Leonie. I'm going to hand over to you in a moment to bring us through what just happened in the Netherlands and crucially what all this might mean for Dutch people and people and businesses in that country and in the neighbourhood. But before that, briefly some housekeeping as ever. This discussion is on the record. If you wish to participate, please contribute questions through the Q&A function you'll see on your screen. Closed captions are available if you'd like to use them, and you can interact with us on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Finally, for me, this meeting is the latest installment in the IIA's new What's Next series, which seeks to better understand the implications of big political events, including elections, by talking to experts about them. So. Over to you, Leo, for the next 20 minutes or so, and then I'm looking forward to the chat. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, yeah, a very tumultuous year, as you already said, in Dutch politics. Um, so what I will try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to uh, bring you up to speed on what's been happening in Dutch politics. Um, quite a quest, actually, because a lot has been happening. Um, the title of my talk is The Rise and Normalization of the Far Right in the Netherlands, because, of course, the Netherlands is a fascinating case study, um, because it's a country that used to be an exception to the rule in the sense that just like Ireland, it didn't have a politically st strongly present far right party in politics uh, just 20 years ago. And within the past two decades, this had completely shifted. And I will try to make some sense of that. So um, let's see if I can change my slides here. There we go. So what I want to try to do is two things. First, bring you up to speed on where we are today. And then in the second part, try to trace how we got to where we are today. Let's start with where we are in politics today. So this is uh, 
what you might say the four sort of key players that are relevant today. Um, so as Barry already introduced, we have currently a new government um, that is made up of these four coalition partners. And from the left to the right, I'll introduce them to you. So on the far left, ironically here, is far right leader Geert Wilders, leader of the Freedom Party, the PVV. He's probably the most well-known internationally. He's been he's a veteran in Dutch politics. Um, he's a textbook, really a textbook case of what you would call a populist radical right politician and party. So his party calls for stringent border controls, uh, wants to stop the alleged tsunami of immigrants, as he will call it, uh, promotes a ban on all Islamic schools, Qurans and mosques. And um, Wilders also pronounced or presents himself as the ordinary, sort of the defender of the ordinary pe people against the morally corrupt elite, so very populist as well. I'll talk more about him later. Then on his side here is uh, Dylan Jeselgus, former Minister of Justice. Uh, she's uh, a member of the Conservative Liberal Party, the VVD. So there'll be a lot of alphabet soup abbreviations today. And um, so she is um, uh, she took uh, over from Mark Rutte, who has been the Dutch Prime Minister for the last uh, 13 years or so. Um, uh, she was set to become the first female Prime Minister of the Netherlands, but then underperformed. I'll talk more about that later as well. Then to her right, we have uh, probably the most interesting character at this point in Dutch politics, Caroline van der Plus from the Farmers uh, Citizens Party, uh, BBB. Now, she describes herself, and I quote, as an ordinary, overweight boomer woman who only has a high school diploma and lives in a terraced house in Deventer. So a small city, uh, not so well-known city, not in the center of the country. And uh, her party is best described as agrarian populist. And one of the reasons for uh, the party's recent success has been the increasing appeal of the so-called nitrogen crisis. You might have heard of this. In 2019, the Dutch government announced plans to reduce nitrogen emissions by cutting back livestock. We have lots of agricultural um, livestock in the Netherlands. Uh, and the plans then spark large scale protest movements across the country by farmers and the BBB grew out of that movement. And then finally, on the far right here, we have Peter Omtzigt, not particularly well known, I would say, internationally. Um, he actually uh, is the leader of NSC, New Social Contract, a new party, which only was set up just three months before the latest elections and then won 20 seats from scratch, coming in fourth which is the second best result of a newcomer party since the history of, uh, since the introduction of universal suffrage in the Netherlands. So quite a big income, uh, in sort of big, um, yeah, a big entrance, I would say. Um, and he actually uh, had left the Christian Democratic CDA party for personal clashes. And what uh, he then set up is a new party that is still very much based on Christian Democratic ideals. You could really say it's a Christian Democratic 2.0 Party and the party's popularity is really mostly due to Omtzigt himself, so the leader of the party, because he's seen as very trusted and respected, notably because he was very dedicated in uncovering the child care benefit scandal. I won't go into that, but that's something that played a few years ago in Dutch politics. Uh, but he has uh, also a lack of charisma, a lack of decisiveness, and a lack of communicative clarity, which uh, led the party to underperform a bit in the end. Um, and he's currently, again, out of the picture because he has a burnout for the second time. So this is the main players and the main parties involved. Uh, and that, of course, happened on the back of a landslide victory for the PVV, the Freedom Party. So here are their latest election results. Uh, the PVV, uh, Wilders' far-right Freedom Party, got almost a quarter of the seats uh, or of the votes in the Netherlands. So really quite a lot for a very fragmented party system. Coming in second here is the uh, GroenLinks P van de A, so a coalition between the left and the Labour Party, who for the first time ran on the joint list. Um, they came in second, but the left uh, was left completely uh, decimated. Um, and then you have the VVD coming in third, NSC fourth, and BBB, as you see here, um, only sixth, if I count correctly, with just about 5% of the vote. Um, so this was sort of the uh, election result. Um, then a new government was formed. So um, in the Netherlands, uh, formation of a government takes quite a long time always because it's such a splintered landscape. And now four parties were needed to form a majority government. 
these four parties then managed to do so. Um, interestingly here, uh, the new government, you will see that the leaders of the four parties that I showed you in the beginning are not present here. And that's because they are not taking seats in the cabinet. And I, I will also say a bit more about that later. Um, so in May 2024, um, the coalition partners published a, a broad outline of their strategy, um, then leaving it up to the ministers to kind of make a bit more detailed sense of those plans. In July 2024, the new cabinet was installed and it was called the cabinet Dick Schoof. This is a, this is a nightmare for the international press, the pronunciation of our new prime minister, Dick Schoof. Schoof, you've probably never heard of him. He is a fairly unknown and also a partyless civil servant. So he's not affiliated with a political party. Um, but he was, before uh, taking over as prime minister, um, he was um, secretary general of the Ministry of Justice and uh, Security and also director general of the General Intelligence uh, and Security Service of the Netherlands. So really a top, top level civil servant. And what they came up with, a construction uh, for a cabinet is uh, what they like to call an extra parliamentary cabinet, a construction that has to do with the fact that nobody was quite comfortable with Geert Wilders, far right uh, flamboyant politici uh, politician uh, as the next prime minister. So the construction has everything to do with that discomfort. And technically, none of the four party leaders are members of the cabinet. So they remain in parliament, which is ideal for Wilders because he can still play the outsider, right? He can still criticize the government, even though behind the scenes, you could say the four leaders are very active in pulling the strings. And the result of this is that we now have the most right-wing uh, government in the history of Dutch politics, in the his recent history of Dutch politics, I would say. So uh, on the 13th of September, that government then presented their, um, uh, their plans for the coming three years. And then today is the budget presentation. Today is actually a very important day in Dutch politics. Um, so there's um, uh, some of the some of the highlights of the plan of this new far right government. Also to illustrate that it really is a far right uh, influenced government is uh, that they are calling for tighter border controls. So there's a lot of focus on immigration and asylum. Uh, the cabinet also has declared its plans to uh, to call an uh, an asylum emergency. And by calling an emergency situation, they they will be enabled to take more drastic steps to reduce the in, inflow of refugees, also bypassing Parliament and the Senate. Um, the Netherlands will also ask the European Union for an opt out so it can deviate from all European refugee uh, treaties. Um, and there will be major cuts in foreign aid uh, and budget, also in higher education. So like grim times for universities in the Netherlands as well. Uh, and then today, of course, is yeah what I already mentioned, Budget Day. It's known as Prinsjesdag or Princess Day. And as we speak, uh, or maybe just before uh, we started this, uh, our king is delivering a speech from the from the throne. Traditionally, the third Tuesday in September, this is happening, which opens the parliamentary new year, and the king then um, presents uh, the government's key plans for the year ahead. So quite a big day. Now, that's kind of the picture of where we are today. Uh, and now I want to tell you a little bit about how we got to this place. Um, so early elections were called in 2023 after Mark Rutte, who had been the longest serving prime minister in Dutch history, uh, resigned following disagreements within the four party coalition over migration policy and asylum. Now, this is um, the Dutch party landscape as it looks like. And I know that for outsiders, this is such a mess, right? Trying to make sense of all these different parties and players. Um, and that is indeed quite complicated. So the Dutch political landscape is best characterized by fragmentation and by volatility. And I will illustrate these two points. Um, but trying to make sense of this and also this question of why do we have so many parties? Why is it so fragmented? Um, and also why voters switch so much between these parties, so the volatility element, it's actually useful to look a bit back into history. So what I will try to do is a bit of a crash course of the history of Dutch post-war politics, which I think will help us make sense of this mess. So looking back into history, you can um, divide the post-war politics phase in the Netherlands into three distinct phases, pillarization, uh, then depolarization, and then finally fragmentation 
and later populism. So I will, I will zoom into these three first phases a bit. So the pillarization phase, um, the structure really, the pillar structure was a way of organizing a very socially divided country composed of minorities, which the Netherlands is. So since the late 19th century, Dutch society was structured around four minority groups, Catholics, Protestants, socialists, and liberals. And each of these groups from broad networks composed of ideological organizations, uh, think uh, newspapers, trade unions, that accompanied people from cradle to grave. And every pillar produced its own political party and members of a political pillar would generally vote for their own pillar party. So if you were born in a Catholic family, you would uh, go to a Catholic school, marry a Catholic, um, and then uh, vote for the Catholic party. Um, so this, um, this pillar structure gave rise to three party families, um, social democrats, so the Labour Party, then Christian Democrats, and uh, finally the uh, Freedom and Democracy Party, so the Liberal Conservative VVD. This is very simplified, so it was a bit more complicated, but to just simplify, right, three big party families. And since uh, voters were loyal to their pillar uh, to which they belonged, election outcomes were super stable and super predictable, making us sort of the textbook case of a frozen party system. Now, all of this changed in the 60s. This is when we uh, enter a period of depolarization. So from the 60s onwards, you had secularization, individualization, which then contributed to the demise of the pillar structure, a process known as depolarization, and new parties emerged, such as D66, uh, so sort of a more progressive liberal party, and also um, uh, parties that would late, later merger into these uh, links, so green left parties, as new topics came to the table. And then uh, we enter a, a period of fragmentation. So 1994 really marked a turning point in Dutch politics when traditional opposites, labor and liberals, decided to actually govern together for the first time uh, without a Christian partner. So these coalition governments were referred to as purple because it mixed the blue of the liberals with the red of the labor, making it purple. Um, and then also the progressive D66 joined uh, to form this sort of purple government. And what happened is that the big pillar parties all shrank to medium-sized parties, creating room on the fringes, of course, for new parties to pop up. This is also how populism and new sort of players emerged on the playing field. The pillar parties, of course, started to look for new voters, which meant that they had to politicize other topics. The center-right, PVD, so conservative liberal party, started to politicize immigration, which opened up new lines of political competition, which ultimately helped till the field for the populist radical right, who would then present themselves as issue owner of this topic. I get to this later. 2002 was a big turning point in Dutch politics. Uh, with the rise of Pim Fortuyn and the list Pim Fortuyn. You see him here in the picture. He's a very big, uh, big famous politician in Dutch politics. He was actually shot dead uh, by an animal rights activist just nine days before the general election in 2002. Um, but from that moment on, politics really changed. So politics would no longer be solely about economics or ethics, but new themes like immigration, culture, the environment came to the fore. Traditional parties had lots of trouble trying to adjust to this new playing field and these new themes. And newer parties then entered the scene because they were able to politicize these new topics. And of course, in the Netherlands, for new parties, it's fairly easy to break through. The Dutch electoral system is known for extreme proportionality. Seats in the lower chamber are distributed according to the number of votes candidates gain across the entire country. So winning just 0.67% of the seats um, of the votes is enough to secure one seat in the 150 seat lower house. And therefore, of course, our electoral system is very favorable to the formation of new small parties. And as a result of these trends and features, Dutch electorates have become very fragmented and volatile. And it's really, really difficult to make any sorts of predictions on election outcomes. In 2021, uh, 89 parties registered in the initial phase, 37, party, uh, uh, 37 parties actually participated in the election and 17 then won seats in parliament. That was a record. And in 2023, uh, there were 70 parties that registered, 26 participated and 15 then won seats in uh, parliament. So very, very messy. But if we zoom out a little bit, 
um, so this is a, a photo of the voting ballot in the Netherlands. I like to show this to my students. So this was in 2021 when we had this massive voting ballot with a, yeah, a record of 37 parties to vote from. But so if we zoom out a bit about this mess, we can actually see, this is the big picture, that you see that in the Netherlands, if we dig a little deeper, you see very stable structures. So for the last 45 years, right-wing parties, so VVD, CDA, so liberals, Christian Democrats, and the far right together have held more seats than left-wing parties, always structurally. Um, the center of gravity in Dutch politics is right of center. And in fact, they've structurally always held around 75 out of the 150 seats, right? So on top of this, so behind of this mess of parties, it's actually fairly stable still, I would say. It means that uh, sometimes we have right-wing governments, but for left-wing parties to form a government, they always need to form coalitions with one or more center-right parties. That's because left-wing parties in the Netherlands are a structural minority. And one of the main reasons uh, why the relations between the left and the right bloc are so stable is because voters largely cluster in blocks. So they will switch between left-wing parties, but not so much moving from a left-wing to a right-wing party. But since 2021, we've had a third bloc emerged in the electorate, and that is a radical right bloc with different radical right parties competing for votes. And we increasingly see that radical right voters sort of switch within that bloc. So really a big structural change in the party landscape. Um, so, uh, and that third block has stabilized in the 2023 election, we really saw the far right block gained and con or consolidated. This brings me to sort of to, toward the end of this uh, talk, which is about the rise and normalization of the far right. So of course it is a broader European trend, right? We've seen um, lots of different countries having far right parties uh, popping up. Uh, but the Netherlands is interesting because for long it was known for its social tolerance. It long formed an exception to the rise of the far right. But in the 21st century, this changed. And you might ask why and also why did almost a quarter of the Dutch vote for Geert Wilders? Now, the success of the PVV, uh, but also populist radical right parties elsewhere, I would argue, is a matter of demand and supply. Meaning that on the one hand, there needs to be a breeding ground, in other words, sufficient voters who are susceptible to far right ideas. On the other hand, there needs to be a credible political contender that can translate lingering demand into actual votes. This is the supply side. And I will briefly walk you to these two elements of the equation. So first, starting with voter demand, populist radical right parties attract voters in general based on their core themes. And this is true across the board, so not just in the Netherlands. Their core themes are opposition to immigration, security, and opposition to multiculturalism. And their voters then are often characterized by a mix of anti-elite populist attitudes on the one hand and support for anti-immigration stances on the other hand. Um, but in these elections in the Netherlands, socioeconomic issues, notably cost of housing, rising cost of living, were also quite high on the agenda. But what the PVV did, so the, the, the Wilders' party, is that they linked this to immigration, for instance, by attributing the housing crisis to immigration, right? By making a very simple equation saying that um, there is no housing for the Dutch because we have so many immigrants. Um, and by using a so-called welfare chauvinist discourse, Wilders appealed to voters who seek economic protection from the state, thereby essentially competing with left-wing parties. The fact, however, that so many voters cast their ballot to the far right, so not for the left, means that the left really struggles to reach this segment of the electorate. I think this is also a story that is true across the board, that left parties are not very successful currently in getting these socioeconomic topics onto the table and uh, reaching these voters that potentially could reach them. However, this is very important, there was not a massive uh, exodus from the left to the right. In fact, most voters still tend to move between ideologically similar parties. It is therefore really mistaken to characterize the Dutch vote as a drastic shift to the right. So you saw many newspaper headlines saying the Netherlands woke up to this massive far right shift and that uh, left sort of traditional labor voters had moved from the left to the far right. That's actually not true. Um, in fact, uh, the far right gained most votes from the center right. 
Um, and um, maybe also important to note is that um, the breeding ground for far-right ideas ha has in fact existed for years. But to explain why so many people now shifted their vote to the far right, so from the center right to the far right, we have to look at the supply side. So that brings me to the second point here, supply. Um, mainstream parties tend to portray themselves across the board as uh, the victims of the rise of the far right. But in fact, um, in my research, I also show this, they play a very important role in their rise. So voters respond to what political supply has on offer. Over the past decades, populist radical right parties managed to successfully politicize socio-cultural divisions, divisions focusing on themes like immigration, multiculturalism, and security. And center-right parties then have tried to tap into these themes, fearing electoral competition and aiming to regain or attract support. You see this now happening in Germany as well. But research indicates that when mainstream parties adopt far-right themes, it actually boosts support for the populist radical right. Um, so to make it very simple, voters will like the original over the copy. This was also very evident in the Dutch elections, where the PVV attracted many voters from the conservative liberal VVD in particular. Early on in the campaign, what happened in the Netherlands is that the VVD, so the center-right, signaled openness to govern with the PVV for the first time. And this was a drastic shift from what the party under Rutte had done. Mark Rutte had really categorically said, we will not govern with the party. His success successor, however, broke with that trend and signaled to voters that the PVV was actually a credible political contender with coalition potential. This was a big game changer. At the same time, the center-right then chose to campaign on migration, a theme that voters primarily associate with the far right. And we know that when mainstream parties and the media focus on themes uh, that are owned by the far right, it tends to increase support for these parties. Wilders also did his part in displaying a milder tone during the campaign, which he persuaded, uh, I think he persuaded some voters um, that he wasn't as radical as he as he used to be. But if you would read the PVV's election manifesto, you could see that, in fact, um, it wasn't very discernible from previous elections. So still very, very radical right. And then the media played also a very important role in the mainstreaming of Wilders. They even called him Geert Milders. A, a milder, a milder, milder version of himself. For example, the public broadcaster's children news TV program showed Wilders visiting an animal shelter with young kittens. Um, the item was called Cuddling Cats with Geert Wilders, which was widely shared and is perhaps the most striking example of a far-right po politician being uh, normalized. So sort of main... Uh, culprits, as it were, if, if, of course, I'm simplifying a bit, but really what played a very important role in the rise and normalization of the far right in the Netherlands are the two main players, mainstream parties and the media. So just to conclude, um, I think the rise of the far right is not purely driven by citizens' concerns and demand. So it's not just that in the Netherlands, there are now many anti-immigrant far right voters all of a sudden. So it's not a massive shift on the demand side. But media and mainstream political parties determine which themes and parties are discussed. And it's obvious that many mainstream parties, especially those on the center right, are trying to regain confidence of voters um, who are attracted to far right politics. But by moving closer to the territory of the far right, um, we, and this is a trend that we see also elsewhere in Europe, what actually happens is that um, you know, yeah, it contributes to the normalization of the far right. And with that, I, uh, I I end this monologue, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts and questions and comments. Thank you.